watching Bloomberg Quint and I'm joined by Cyril Shroff, the managing partner of Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas. Mr. Shroff was a committee member on the 23-member committee led by Uday Kotak, deputed by SEBI to look into several corporate governance matters. They have published their report or recommendations to SEBI today and here to talk about some of those key recommendations and the rationale behind them is Mr. Shroff. Thank you very much for your time uh, and speaking to Bloomberg Quint. Uh, Mr. Shroff, I've tried to read the committee, speed, the, read the report, speed read it, and a couple of things that struck me, uh, and, and they all sort of come together, right? For instance, you have recommended uh, that not only should the size of boards be increased from three minimum members to six minimum members, but that half the board, in the case of listed companies of certain sizes, so the large ones, should be f uh, independent. So if you had six members on the board, at least three would be independent, from what I understand it. Then you've gone on to extend that principle also when you look at committee structures. So for instance, the nomination and remuneration committee, you know, uh, you have said that should be two-third independent. So I'm just trying to understand what prompted the committee to take as substantive a view as half the board being independent. So I think first let's just step back, Minka, in terms of what was uh, some of the background and the which a committee like this got uh, constituted and what was the sort of direction and some of the rationale for it. Now, I'm not getting into the mind of SEBI, but I think yeah. uh, just inferring the general business environment. So the, uh, the question of uh, and the issue surrounding corporate governance have always been live for the last uh, decade and a half. There were several versions both in the Companies Act, SEBI has made various attempts to it as well. But the whole conversation around uh, corporate governance, which represents such a big part of uh, sort of India's prosperity, uh, had become uh, a very emotive issue uh, again. And I'm not referring to any specific cases, but it had, had become so integral to the India story going forward that something had a closer look was required and something had to be done again uh, for, for sort of revamping the entire uh, space. Uh, the approach to it as we sort of went through the debates was to build upon all the good work that had been done in the past and to look upon it as a further evolution of sort of corporate governance 3.0 or 4.0 as you call it. It's not a revolution but more as an evolutionary kind of approach to look at the models itself and, and look at all the institutions that corporate law uh, as applicable to listed companies are supposed to sort of do their various roles and responsibilities. And I think the, the, the consensus was that many of them had become uh, were either broken or were written with too many conflicts uh, or uh, required to be refreshed in terms of their efficacy with giving them sharper tools. So, if, forgive me, one of which, yeah. well, just, just one very brief interruption here. Uh, I'm surprised that th there was the need felt to do this at this stage because just about two or three years ago we went through a fairly large corporate governance rehaul when the Companies Act 2013 was enacted uh, as a result of which there were several changes made in SEBI's listing obligations clause 49 etc etc so it's just about two years ago that we went through uh, you know a sea change for instance in the way related party transactions right. are approved and reported and disclosed what what would have prompted us in two years to relook at it so extensively? It's a 177-page report. So, sort of two points over there. I think the Companies Act is more general because it applies both to listed and unlisted companies. And uh, SEBI as the market regulator needed both more jurisdiction as well as more sharper tools for governing the listed company. There's over 5,000 listed companies, which is uh, where, uh, you know, really a lot of the, the uh, business takes place. So I think there's a nuanced difference between the Companies Act and uh, what SEBI does, and they work together. So I think that is one. Uh, I think the second piece was, again, this is again an evolutionary thing. So corporate governance, there's no finishing line to a corporate governance conversation. Or, or thinking about it in terms of you know every 10 years we should do something. I think the 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 environment in the country required a relook at it because of several conflicts and the roles of various uh, organs of corporate governance not being very sharply defined. So there was I think there was a need, and as we went into the details of each of the uh, the elements of it, we realized that. Uh, there were a lot of loopholes that required to be plugged. So, 
to come back to the main recommendation, or at least the most eye-catching one, that half the board should be independent. Uh, you know, I could counter argue, Mr. Shroff, and I no. could use your words in some of the debates that we've really done, bad. where you've questioned the, you know, the taking away of control from promoters, uh, you know, by adding more and more uh, governance requirements in companies, uh, you know, insisting on more independent directors on board. Why would I take the risk to start a company, to build it up, to list it, if despite majority shareholding, I have no control over the board, that half the board is independent? Well, that doesn't necessarily mean you don't have control. Uh, I think the independence, uh, the independence on the board are, uh, are there for sort of giving balance to the sort of interests of all the stakeholders. If the board may, may or may not vote in my favor or in the favor of the resolution well, I'm I moving. Think that that's why I think the conversation has moved forward in terms of a broader, even how company law has changed, where there's a responsibility to a broader set of stakeholders and not just the shareholders. So I, I see your point in terms of whether this dilutes the control debate, but for well-governed uh, well governed companies which balance the interests of all stakeholders, there is a right balance and there is no con there shouldn't be a, such a conflict on, uh, in terms of, uh, of objectives. But we live in a real world where often promoters want to do with companies. And I, when I say promoters, yeah, I mean yeah. majority shareholders. Let me dispense with the word promoter yeah, yeah. because it's sort of very old-fashioned sounding. Yes. Majority yeah. shareholders, those who have control, are being deprived of it, even though they have it through voting rights and shares, are being deprived of it in the boardroom because half the board will be independent and it may or may not agree with the controlling shareholders' decisions. So, in effect, why would I bother to ever build a controlling stake in a company? See, it's always a reaction to something that happens in the real world. And if, if the, rea the, the general perception is that if the investing public and the market has lost faith in that model to some extent, that promoters having that kind of control uh, misuse or abuse their power, and there's again, there'll always be exceptions, uh, then that needs to be fixed. And this was the, uh, one of the key tools that was used. In your experience, does this exist anywhere in the world, or will India become the first country in the world See, to I mean, mandate? I mean, I think there's a lot happening in terms of the nature of the balance between equity and debt, mm. bankruptcy code, and all of that. I think there's also a lot happening in terms of the new genre of companies that are coming to market. They're not coming to market with a traditional model where promoters hold 51% and 75%. A lot of the new age businesses come with very small promoter holding, large institutional that's holding. Yes. So that's 10 years from now, you will probably find much less of the old world type of companies and much more of, uh, particularly in technology or, uh, there is this migration which is taking place from the old economy to the new economy. I mean, the ownership model is very different. Okay. I also want to get your thoughts on some of the other uh, key highlights that I was able to pick up in my speed reading of the report. I think uh, one has to do with, uh, you know, the the separation of the role of chairman and CEO, which was, I think, uh, recommendatory mandatory. in the Companies Act, and you all have made it mandatory in the case yes, of Yes, in a staggered companies. time frame. In a staggered time, time frame. frame. Uh, the fact that the chairperson should be a non-executive, that also yes. I thought was important, yes. in, in companies that have 40% uh, public shareholding and more. Yes. Uh, the inclusion of the mandatory uh, requirement of one woman independent director. So the Companies Act went took the first step by saying one woman director, you all have taken the next step by saying it has to be an independent director. director. So no wives, daughters, sisters-in-law, mothers on the board. Yeah. So these are two or three. There were some examples with maid servants as well. Oh, okay. is it? <laughs> yes. Maid servants? Yes. On the board? Uh, on, on, on some of them. So again, that, I mean, no, that's no, the exception. No, listed companies. Listed. Listed companies. Yeah. Maid servants. Uh, anyway, so uh, leave that aside. Well, so again, that's how uh, some of these things get misused. Yes, yeah, so I, I think that, a tighter definition of independent directors, uh, an age limit, what I loved the most was a 50% attendance requirement because over the last several years we've been noticing that several independent directors or several directors just don't attend at yes. all, you know, even independent directors sometimes. Uh, so all of this, you know, if you could give so us a broad several, rush, several yeah. points over what there. was the most important thing in your yeah, book? Uh, uh, I think we already discussed the 50% independence. Yeah. Let's talk of separation of chairman and CEO. Okay. So, uh, we went back to first principles, and the first principles is that there is the ownership body, which is the shareholders, leaving aside other stakeholders just now, uh, then the board, and then the management. And when you have the chairman and the uh, CEO in the same position, you don't separate the two of in terms of board, 
which is the responsibility for governance uh, and the management itself. There is a fundamental disconnect between uh, these two concepts. So we, th what this does is it actually separates them into the three constituent parts. Okay. With a chairman who is non-executive, is responsible for oversight of the management and governance. And I think it gives a certain purity to that concept. The management is to run the business and to, uh, to make profits. Uh, as as well, the shareholders again really exercise in some sense ownership control uh, as an entire body over uh, both the organs. So I think it, it, it boils it down to its three constituent elements in a very purist sort of way. Okay. I think this is a big one. Okay. The third more noteworthy one comes in the chapter when you talk about promoters. Yes. Uh, and there there is the detail laying out of the sharing of information. Uh, by those yes. who are considered to be yes. continuous insiders or continuously in uh, possession of insider information. Uh, it was a little technical, I learned bit, and I was reading it really fast. Mm -hmm. I couldn't quite get the gist of it. Could you explain to us what you all were hoping to achieve there? Yeah, this is one of the sort of top few recommendations of, uh, of the report. So let's see what happens today in, uh, uh, in corporate India. And again, it's not just about promoters. It could include multinationals uh, and several other kind of formats. So uh, information sharing today uh, happens sort of in the shadows. It happens in informal channels. Uh, there is a regulatory white space over here. Mm. So the traditional method of justifying it under the existing insider trading regulations uh, is that it happens for a legitimate purpose. Yes. Uh, and that, and that, that the controlling promoter or controlling shareholder has a legitimate purpose to receive this information. But it all, it's all gray. And in fact, what happens is that very often the controlling shareholders have access to special information uh, on the verge of important transactions or price sensitive events. There are good companies and there are bad companies, but very, what happens in the latter variety very often is that this information leaks and then is the basis of a lot of market manipulation and it right. is rampant. Uh, what this does is that it reinforces the line around the fact that uh, inform price sensitive information which occurs in the boundaries of the company with insiders should not travel outside mm. uh, the, the boundaries of the company. But if it has to do so because controlling shareholders and promoters require access to their information, this creates a green channel. What this does is that it requires people who are in, the, in that position to enter into a formal agreement with the company. They need to meet the eligibility criteria for this, either they're promoters or promoters of promoters. Uh, or it, if they're 25 percent and mostly like a private equity house. And if they require access to continuous information to guide the strategy of the company, then instead of saying, no, you can't get it, this actually helps them because it creates a, a, a green channel which gives them peace of mind that there is now at least a formal, uh, it's like legalizing uh, prohibition uh, in terms of, and it is, it's a very similar analogy. Uh, rather than uh, banning something altogether and having it done in the shadows, this creates a legal channel for access to information with safeguards. Obviously, it doesn't do away with the rest of the insider trading code. Uh, so, uh, trading on the basis of this information will still be dealt mm -hmm. with this, and there's a separate set of But just sharing the information, sharing the information if done within this framework, as you've pointed out, without, will is, no is longer kosher, be because then it's sort of exempted from. And the, it's not a violation of it's the. Not. So, so the let's ITO. take examples of multinationals who have listed subsidiaries in India, they have constant access of information. There is an information asymmetry. The normal right. public does not have it. And today it just happens just on the basis of informal reporting. What they will now need to do with this is to sign agreements under this green channel. Uh, and the, the example, the words that are used are the information goes from one safe container to another safe container with a paper trail. And these agreements will be signed by, like you said, multinationals board, with parent or companies? Or can it whoever access to information, even a promoter's promoter as well. So can it be, for instance, in the Infosys case, many people were raising the question on how Mr. Murthy seemed to have information that general shareholders did not have or public shareholders did not have would those kinds of relationships also need to be so covered i don't want to framework? comment on that case but you, as an illustration uh, yeah but even then i want to stay away from that but still uh, someone like that would not get access to information uh, because i can give you a tata mystery <laughs> example but i suspect you might not want to comment on that as well. i don't want to comment on either because, <laughs> okay. uh, but uh, uh, you need to be in a controlling position so as, if you're in control then you have a legitimate okay. and that's why it creates this or you could be someone like a pe house who has has a, a nominee on the board. Okay, that's a better illustration, yeah, yeah. not less yeah. controversial. Yeah, 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 okay, yeah, fine. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, okay, the but other... But it, it, it addresses the basic issue of 
information asymmetry in the markets. All right, fair enough. I, I must confess, I would like to study it a little bit more, and I'm sure I'll have many more questions uh, right after that. But the, the next thing I wanted to move to was uh, related party transactions, where you all have suggested that uh, though the SEBI requirements go one step beyond the Companies Act and say no related party can vote on a related party transaction, okay. you have said make an exception there and allow for a related party to cast a negative vote. Yes. What was the purpose of that? So sometimes related parties, let's say include families which have different factions, and sometimes people within their group have different views. Okay. So you could have uh, either because of their dis internal differences or whatever may be the reason, and that block sometimes is used in order to achieve a certain outcome. But if other than the sort of uninterested sort of non-related party shareholders, if there's somebody in that group who also believes that there is an abuse that is taking place, they can vote against but not in favor. Okay, got it. So it gives more fire. I can think of one more illustration. I know you will duck comment, but I think wasn't the recent Raymond case about two factions no of the comment, family? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, no comment, yeah, no, no comment. comment. Uh, more interestingly, what you have plugged through these recommendations is the fairly ugly practice of these sudden brand agreements that come about yeah. where a promoter or a promoter a related entity uh, turns out to be the owner of the, the corporate brand and then is to be paid a royalty for it. I'll give you another illustration no, there. You will duck comment again for the Jindal, uh, you know, JSW group witnessed that a couple of years ago and it became fairly controversial. And in this case, you have said that it will require minority of majority. Yes. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it is all ultimately all about conflicts of interest. Okay. Um, so I and, think and not using voting in your own favor, basically. Yeah. Uh, have I covered some of the key? Some of I, the key. I think so. I think the we, we discussed um, chairman and uh, yeah. We discussed also. chairman and the CEO. Women director, fifty percent woman, woman director, director. Uh, fifty percent attendance, a tighter definition. I think there's also a, 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 a sort of a point which is important but sort of buried in a little bit of the details, is about the spirit of independence. Okay. Uh, now, it's not about just a form of independence, namely ticking all these boxes and not having relationships which would compromise your independence, but also about the mental state. So we had a big debate on can we really legislate for character, can we really legislate for what goes on in people's minds. But uh, And finally, I think the formulation that came out was to put the burden back on the conscience of the board and the independent director that there is nothing else that uh, a social friendship, for instance, uh, or uh, a, 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 a relationship which is you know, it doesn't technically kind of meet this, but we know it's not independent. There have been cases where people have been neighbors for 30 years who would not uh, fail the independence test, but by no stretch of imagination would be so independent. So how have you prescribed against so that? So there is a, the, 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 the independent director has to say that he's not aware of any circumstance which would compromise his independence, and the board has to accept that view, board and including the independent directors. So this sort of puts the, it's, it was very hard to legislate on this, but I think it at least, uh, puts the spotlight on this and forces people to think about this question a bit more deeply. I mean, I have faced situations where people have said, you know, we've grown up together and, uh, you know, how can I be independent? Don't count, you know, I, I would never do anything against this, but they would meet all the tests. So we sort of po focusing a bit there as well. And then there is interlocking directorships that has been dealt with as well, where okay. people on each other's boards, technically independent, but we all know why they're there. Okay, uh, so my very final, quick, okay. very brief question is this. Um, you and I have often talked about how in India we tend to get very prescriptive of many things uh, because we're constantly trying to counter-legislate against scams or controversies and situations like that. Um, in your recommendations, you all have made prescriptions or recommendations on updation of knowledge for independent directors or for directors, how non-executive directors should meet with managements at least once a year, matrix reporting structures, etc., etc., etc. Do you think your committee also has somewhere given in to the temptation of being prescriptive? So one what of the other committee members actually business? used a very nice phrase, which he said that uh, this committee had both a microscope as well as a telescope at the same time. So we had to do the microscope because uh, I think as people and as you say in the real world, we know uh, how people uh, sometimes find loopholes around the spirit and escape from the applicability. Uh, and we needed to have a telescope for we looked ahead and see why would we want to be remembered? Why would this committee want to be remembered and how would it want to be remembered? Uh, 
this is not the last committee on corporate governance. I'm sure a few years from now there will be another one in some form or the other because you, you need to keep this continuous conversation. But at least did it move the needle and change the status quo at this point of time or not? So if it is implemented as recommended, I think it will move the needle. And do you really think that SEBI will implement 50% uh, of the board being independent? SEBI has been amazingly supportive on this. Firstly, the very fact that... You think Corporate India will allow for that capture of so, control from the hands of the promoter or the controlling mm -hmm. shareholder into the hands of the independent directors? So we, we, we will know soon in a few months from uh, that. I mm -hmm. think your smile gives away <laughs> yeah, more than I can say. No, I think this is going to be, this is going to be uh, a big national conversation and which was the idea. I think this will, this will spark like this interview does. Uh, a lot of conversations in the coming weeks. Mr. Shaw, I appreciate you finding the time to talk to us today on Bloomberg Queen. Uh, with that, those were some of the key highlights of the report. As he says, I'm sure we'll debate this a lot more in the days to come.